All right, so who are we? Why are we here? What are we doing? We're going to get to all of that, and I'll tell you who I am, so I'm not um, some stranger behind a screen. Um, we'll get to all of that over the next hour and 20 minutes. But before we do any of that, I want to start with a hypothetical. So I want all of you to imagine that it is the not too distant future. It's the year 2027. And honestly, every year that this class goes on, I should keep putting this into the further future. Um, the year 2027, you are a kid who has a day off from school. Your name is Bill or Billy or Sam or Joey, and you decide to have some fun. So we decide to play some video games. So you put on your VR headset and you decide to zap some bad guys. And over the course of the morning, you find these invaders, you target them, you shoot them, and you clear every single last one. Mission accomplished, you've won the game. But there's a twist. Then you take off, take off your headset, not only have you won the game, but you have actually zapped the tumor of a cancer patient. So this is pretty far-fetched, but that's that's what we're here to talk about today. We're going to talk about technologies, big ideas, big challenges, and how we can foster our own imaginations to think about, um, you know, making the impossible possible. So you finished your game, The Tuminator, which I think is pretty funny, but that's just me. So today's class is called Engineering Tomorrow, Fostering a Culture, culture of Disruption and Innovation. And my hope is by the end of this, you will have walked away with a sense of what innovation is, um, the emerging trends and technologies that impact the future of innovation, particularly as it pertains to medicine, because this is the technology and the future of medicine class, um, to explain the why, why does it matter, why, why do we need to innovate, um, and to talk about some of the greatest challenges we face both as a species and particular to medicine, and then also the how of how to foster an innovation mindset. And then separate from all of this, which we'll talk about next class, is design and how it pertains to innovation in a very, very specific context. So to begin with, I want to ask three questions. First of all, what is innovation? Why does it matter? And how does one innovate? So first of all, before we go into any of that, someone feel free to unmute yourselves. Tell me what this is. A bottle. It's a bottle, exactly. So what can you do with a bottle? Uh, you can transport water to wherever you want to take it. Yep. Or, it up in air and make it into like a rocket or something. You can make it into a rocket, perfect. Any other suggestions? You can put Mentos in it if it's Coke and make it explode. <laughs> that's, and that's also a way to make a rocket, yep. Uh, and we'll take one more suggestion. I think you can also use it as like a light bulb. If you put it on. As a light bulb. You guys must have seen this presentation before. So yeah, a bottle is only limited by your imagination and a bottle can be a planter can be a chandelier, can be a bird feeder, can be a jewelry sorting case, it can be a pencil case, it can be an art installation, and it can be a piggy bank, or a rocket, as you guys say. And of course, it can be used to carry water. Um, you can even re redesign the bottle. You can make the bottle better. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, this is one of my favorite videos ever. And it's about pointing the inefficiencies in bottles in their current form. And um, in earlier versions of this course, before this ever existed, I would complain about how bottles are inefficient because when you turn them over, at least some percentage of the product is left in the bottle. Um, and you know, if you add up all those inefficiencies over time and all of the wastelands and all of the um, landfills across the country, it's gonna add up to tons. So why not re-engineer the bottle to have a different cohesive properties so the substance in the bottle adheres more to itself 
than to the bottle surface. And this is exactly what you just saw. That's what one group at the MIT Media Lab um, did, and they re-engineered the bottle. So it's not just thinking about different uses for bottles, but the way um, that bottles are engineered all together. By the way, did that video show up okay as I was switching screens? Yeah, perfect. Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, so that was a very quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. So who the heck am I and who the heck are you? I think that's the next important question to answer. So my name is Dr. Shauna Pandya. I am in year nine, I think, of involvement in this course, which makes me feel old. So I'm a physician in family medicine. I cover rural ER, a graduate at the University of Alberta. I'm a scientist astronaut candidate as one of my other hats. So this is from my first ever parabolic flight campaign in 2015, actually where we tested zero uh, spacesuits in zero gravity. We were part of the first commercial crew to do that. And we've done it six more times since. Um, I wear a lot of different hats as an entrepreneur. I'm the VP of Immersive Medicine for Telephonic Technologies, which we'll talk about since it's rather fitting to this course. Um, do a lot of research related to space, telemedicine, um, space medicine, and also a bit of an adventurer in extreme environments. Um, I have uh, performed, I'm an aquanaut, have done an underwater mission as well as several missions at the Mars Desert Research Station um, in the Utah desert. So that's a quick introduction to me. Um, also a speaker, I've spoken at three TEDx events. Um, and really, uh, I'd say I first got involved with this course uh, when Kim and I met at Singularity University. Um, as grads over 10 years ago now, and then Kim put, put together this fabulous course. Um, and I've been teaching in it uh, sessionally ever since. So that is me, but I would also like to know all about you. So we will go around the virtual room and just tell me who you are, your name, um, what you're currently studying, um, and if you want, how, you're, how you are adapting to the pandemic and what you hope to get out of this course. So um, maybe I'll just go down the list. Um, Eduardo, you are first up, so go ahead. Oh, uh, my name is Ed. Uh, maybe I think we hear a little bit of echo. Could you mute yourself? Sure. Um, yeah, my name is Ed. I'm a PhD student. Uh, I work in the Department of Medicine. Um, I came across the course going through the through the uh, course list of the U of A, and this was the one that caught my eye the most. And um, and then, what do I want to get out of it? Well, to see what's missing in in medicine, and, and see how I can use my well, what I know to contribute to those missing spots and and help in the future. Um, and how am I adapting to the pandemic? Uh, well, we just came back to the lab, so it's fun to use the mask. It's a new reality, and um, I think overall I enjoy it because I get to spend more time with uh, at home, and we have a lovebird, so the lovebird is happier with us at home. So yeah, that's that's uh, that's me. So over to you. Oh. Oh, I don't know what's happening. Uh, we can hear you now. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Did you say you have a lovebird? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. uh, in the first two uh, classes, I was at home and he was with me. He's very, he's very attached. So he likes when we're at home, he dislikes when we go to work. So right now uh, we are working here at the university at, and we go home around five and he gets upset that we have been outside so long. But then he, he prefers his mom better than me. I'm uh -huh. Uh, so one thing I left out of my introduction is I'm obsessed with birds. I have two little budgies at home. So extra credit on any homework that you submit that has pictures of birds in it. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, maybe I'll put some pictures of my own birds in the next presentation. 
Um, all right, so next up we have, let me just scroll down. I think it looks like Kaylin. Um, it's a bit uh, covered by the scroll button, but I hope I got your name right. Go ahead. Sure, yeah, my name is Kaylin. Uh, you pronounced it right, so that's a lot of people don't, so kudos to you. Uh, I'm going into my third year of marketing. I actually started in science in my first year, and then I realized I really didn't like labs, but I actually wanted to become an astronaut. So when you were talking all about your um, NASA and all that, I was like, wow, that's so cool. Um, and so now it's kind of just circling back to how I can use my skills in marketing and business to help in, um, in tech, the tech world, and also in medicine. Oh, awesome. Uh, well, there will be a lot of space medicine, more so next lecture. So um, guys, stick around for that. That's really mm -hmm. wonderful. And just because you're in marketing doesn't mean there's a role for you in space, especially with the um, rise of commercial space flight. So keep that in mind. Um, perfect. Next down on my list is Joel. Go ahead. Awesome. So yeah, my name is Joel. I, um, I, so I have a I just graduated actually last year from a degree in, in biological sciences here, and I'm in open studies now. Um, somehow, so I, I was in the faculty of science and somehow got involved in student governance. So I'm pretty involved in the students union um, over the past uh, two and a half, uh, three years. <clears throat> so that's, uh, it's kind of been an unexpected path that I've been uh, uh, following over the past couple of years, but it's been um, very eye opening. I've been learning a lot. Um, part of how I found this course was actually a friend of mine who um, posted it on Facebook and I thought this looks really interesting uh, So I have a background in like health uh, policy and health services research and um, specifically in um, respiratory health and uh, you know I just I'm, I've always been sort of interested in, in this kind of stuff and kind of understanding that there's this whole potential for uh, AI in and diagnoses and, and all of that and how there may be a need for policy and in, in guiding you know the ethics and, and a framework for how how machines can do that instead of uh, physicians so i um, really excited to, to learn about um, all of the, the, the really cool experiences that uh, I'm sure you mentioned earlier that you're an astronaut I think that's that's really fascinating as well so I'm, I'm really excited to hear from you today in uh, the next classes Awesome, very cool. I actually got my start out in um, student governance at the at the SU level as a student counselor and GFC counselor way back in the day. Um, so that's awesome. It's always really good to be involved. Oh, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. Next up on my list, I have Khadija. Hopefully, I'm saying your name right. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you okay. loud. Yeah, uh, so I am Khadija and I am a PhD student in the Department of Medicine. And uh, I am doing my PhD. I am a second year. So uh, I have like done all the required courses for my degree and they needed one more course to do. And uh, it was a kind of open thing just to look up what would be interesting. I came across this through the calendar. Uh, I thought it would be a nice idea to go uh, to do this course this semester because it would be you know something different add up to my knowledge and uh it, it looks like it, it is the real future that we will come through and it's a good idea to have a like basic knowledge at least through the course wonderful well welcome next up on my list i have devansh am i saying your name right i hope i am yeah uh, that's right uh, well, hi, I'm Devansh, and uh, I'm uh, in my second year undergrad studying immunology and infection. Uh, so far, we haven't gotten into any immunology courses yet, so I can't really apply it to the current pandemic going on. But I'm still looking forward to it as it comes along. As it comes along. Um, well, uh, I'm working with Dr. Solas in his lab right now, and uh, from there I found out that he's also teaching this course and. It's pretty interesting because usually when we think about AI and technology, it's about a utopia or a dystopia, like it's how it's depicted in media. But I think out of this course, uh, it'll be a better way to see how 
more realistic way of how the future might look. Wonderful. Um, and yeah, stick to it because um, I did my neuroscience degree at U of A and it's really in third and fourth year that you get into the fun of what you're studying in specific um, and specifically. But um, yeah, the first two years tend to be pretty general, but welcome to the course. Next up, we have Nicole. Um, my name is Nicole. I'm an after degree student in computer science. Um, I did my first degree in business with a marketing major and worked in marketing for a few years and then um, got interested in programming. So I went back to school for that and then just worked on that. Um, I decided to take this course because I, um, taken a lot of like the machine learning AI type courses um, on like the math side and doing like analysis on things like games. And I kind of wanted to see how like those courses applied to like a bigger picture and like the future and how those will be used to change everything. Perfect, that's great to see that we have such a, such a wide breadth of disciplines and levels of study here. Um, Leanne, you're next. Hi, I'm Leanne. I'm in my fifth and final year um, in business and I'm majoring in operations management and I kind of got interested in tech through various like work positions and professional placements um, that talked a lot about emerging technology, AI and machine learning, but it was always used sort of as buzzwords. Um, so I was, <laughs> I was really excited to be able to take a course where we could really see the relevance um, and impact of technology and AI and how uh, we can learn more about it to actually shape what the future looks like. Yeah, for sure. We'll definitely be speaking all about emerging technologies this session in particular. All right, um, home stretch. Ashley, you're up next. Okay, um, I'm Ashley. I'm in my fourth year of my physiology degree or undergrad, um, and I'm just in the process of figuring out what I want to do for my master's. Uh, so I also work in the anatomical pathology lab um, at the hospital. So I, I kind of have the lab medicine background as well. Um, and so because of all these kind of combined interests, I know that I want to go in, I want to do research for the rest of my life in reproduction, placentas, or fetal development in that kind of area. And I know that uh, it's a very um, I don't know, controversial area that sometimes uh, up and coming like technology of say making a placenta outside of the uterus or um, kind of concepts like that are <laughs> up and coming. Um, and I thought that this class would be kind of a good thing to, I don't know, be aware of what's coming up and to get a jump on thinking about it. Very cool. Yeah, you know, medicine, even since I've graduated, has changed quite a bit. You know, uterine um, transplants, um, you know, giving a uterus to a, a recipient so they can um, become pregnant wasn't a thing when I was in med school, and now it is. Um, so, you know, the future's, future's here, uh, and that's what we're here to discuss. So last but not least, um, Ishita, go ahead, and then we'll bring it back to lecture. Sure. Um, so, hello, everyone. Um, I have taken this course before and I actually TA'd for it. So I just thought that because I'm really interested in the content and I think it's relevant to me, I'm doing my master's in neuroscience right now. So I think going into research fields and just being involved in like clinical fields in general, I think it's really um, like a developing topic right now to think about the integration of technology and the future of the field. So yeah, I think it's a really, cool course to be a part of. Wonderful. Well, welcome back. All right. Have I missed anyone? Perfect. Okay. So let's get into the crux of it in the hour we have remaining. So first of all, what is innovation? So just yell it out. Feel free to unmute yourselves. You know, what does it mean in your mind? Give some examples. Well, with the with the bottle example, it was clear that it's needed. You need to think out of the box mm -hmm. to come up with new uses of maybe something that has already been around for a while. Maybe that could be a 
partial answer. Yeah, so repurposing um, some an existing technology or product for a new use, for sure. Go ahead. Anyone else? I think coming up like maybe like using novel ideas or using sort of what's around in your environment to solve a problem in the world. Yeah, trying to create new solutions, looking for opportunities, sure. Any other ideas? I think to kind of follow up, you were up with what you were saying about uh, like bridging the gap. So if you're looking for a market gap or say there's a problem that you find and there's no solution currently, so you're looking for new ways to do something different that can help alleviate that gap. Perfect. Yeah. So repurposing, um, you know, looking for new challenges to solve, but also looking for new opportunities. Perfect. All right. So you guys have kind of hit on it. So we can talk about building upon what already exists. So I'm dating myself a little bit and I will be throughout this entire lecture. But uh, I grew up in the era of Windows 95. We're now beyond Windows 10 at this point. Um, taking ideas and making them more portable. Um, some of us, depending on our age, either grew up with desktop and laptop computers. Well, now in our phones, we have more computing power in our hand than all of NASA had when they sent men to the moon in 1969. Um, and so that's translated into what started with the iPod, uh, translating to the iPhone, smartphone, and now um, iPads and tablets. It can be a completely novel answer to an idea that we never even knew, to a problem we never knew we had vis-a-vis -vis the flying car. So let's see if this diff works. Oh, it doesn't. Um, but there are companies uh, like Terrafugia, and I think this one's called Aeromobile, that are genuinely building prototypes for hybrid cars that can also take off and ensure you're never stuck in a traffic jam again. Um, and this also kind of ties into the, the earlier issue that we touched upon during the intros about, well, what else needs to happen for this to become a reality? Well, you need to, you can have a solution, but who's your user? How do you market this? Um, who's going to pay for it? And then even if that is all put into place, what about policies? If you're a pilot, you have a very strict set of laws and regulations regarding to air traffic and how you, who gets right of way when. So then how do you integrate drivers who suddenly want to be pilots too? Elsewhere in um, solutions to problems we never knew we had in, Boards. So if there's any Back to the Future fans out there, uh, no longer a in the realm of science fiction and Hollywood movies. So this is from a few years ago. I think it's a 2016 um, marketing shot when uh, Buzz Aldrin was invited to Autodesk and in the San Francisco head office to test out their um, first ever prototype of a hoverboard, which is based on, I think, magnetic... Um, yeah, there's, there's some sort of rotating magnet in there. Um, and then, you know, there's uh, the idea of repurposing emerging technologies. So drones are, you know, we're seeing them more prevalent in the delivery business. Amazon is experimenting with drones. And, you know, throughout the entrepreneurial space, we see drones for food delivery, drones for fun, drones for photography, and even drones for um, drug delivery. And there's startups dedicated to all of these things. Um, and, you know, coming back to that, um, or that discussion that we touched upon in that theme is that now regulations are evolving um, to become, to try to catch up as to where you can fly a drone, how high, what is restricted airspace. So this is one of my favorite examples. This comes out of Stanford Labs. This is smart technology that, um, again, a solution to a problem no one ever asked for. Um, this is technology, it's furniture that can evolve and come to you when you decide you need to put your feet up. So, finally, 3D printing. So we're coming back to the medicine um, sphere in the next slide here. So when we talk about 3D printing, also known as add additive manufacturing. So we think of putting in the specifications to whatever it is you want to build, developing the model for it, and then simply putting in the key components. 
and develop and printing it out on your printer. And so we can have 3D printing for art. This picture is kind of cool because, and, and slightly gross, because someone took a picture of someone sneezing and then captured mm -hmm. the particulate matter and then computer modeled that and then inputted that into a 3D printer and then printed out the sneeze particulate as a vase to create not as art. So, um, you know, all it takes is a little creativity at times. We have 3D printing for food, so you can have your face and eat it too. 3D printing, coming back to medicine for tissue culture and tissue engineering. 3D printing in space. So we're going to touch on more on why it's important to be able to print what you need as you go in the next lecture when we talk about the space flight environment. And 3D printing for prosthetics. Here you can see a turtle who had pyramidalism and was lacking the top part of their shell and was given a turtle shell prosthesis through 3D printing. Coming back finally to, to innovative methods in medicine. So sorry, I should have warned you there were gory pictures in this. Um, this was a factory worker, I believe in China, who had his hand severed in a factory accident. Um, and what the plastic surgeon did while his hand, the traumatic stump recovered, was grafted the hand back onto the calf so it had a blood supply. And once the stump had healed up, was able to retransplant the hand. So it's, it's exactly what you guys said. It's taking, looking for new, new solution spaces, new problem spaces, taking new ideas and building upon them to create new solutions. Here's another example of um, innovation in material science. So <laughs> this is a simulated oil spill in, and this new material is super absorbent and it's designed to help mop up um, oils um, in the event of oil spill. And so it has very um, cohesive properties towards um, oil or I guess adhesive properties towards oil matter and can be used to um, clean up potential environmental disasters up to 90 times if needed. Okay, so that was just kind of to give you an idea of what exists in terms of material science, in terms of science fiction ideas come to life, in terms of soft software, in terms of hardware, of what exists in terms of emerging technology. So I want to spend the next part of this lecture talking about opportunities and problem spaces in medicine. Um, before I do, are there any questions or comments so far? Nope. Okay, perfect. Um, I think I have the chat minimized right now. So if something comes up in the chat, I think it'll pop up, but if not, then meet yourselves. Okay. So let's talk about some principles of healthcare. So what are what is the ideal state of medicine? The ideal is to either not get sick at all and just be healthy throughout our lives. If we can, if we as doctors can engineer ourselves out of our patients' lives, then we're doing something right. So that means either having the ability to prevent illness before it starts or being able to quickly and accurately diagnose and treat in a very surgical precise manner. So the NIH, the National Institute of Health in the United States, has come up with what we call the 5P model, um, which kind of encapsulates all of these principles, predictive, personalized, precise, preventative, participatory, um, and as a bonus, um, that's emerged in the past decade, point of care. So what does this all mean? It means that, like we said, we want to either not predict getting sick and prevent getting sick before it ever happens. We want medication and treatments to be targeted towards how a specific patient might react. So think about aspirin for now. It's, it's sold right now as a, as a single dose, either baby aspirin or adult aspirin. But if you consider a five foot two, 100 pound woman versus a six foot three, 200 pound man, is it necessarily uh, reasonable to expect that they'll both need the same dose? So that's what we mean by personalized and precise medicine. Um, participatory. So um, medicine has really changed from the doctor saying, take two aspirin, call me in the morning to tell me your experience with your disease um, and having the patient really be 
an owner and take ownership of their own health. Um, and lastly, with point of care medicine, and we'll also talk more about this next lecture, is having those instant results. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, COVID uh, later this lecture, but it's not easy to, to make that stretch of imagination when we think about um, point of care and you know seeing the worst um, application of mass testing in certain parts of the states where people are having to wait up to 10 days to get results for their tests when the ideal would be to know as soon as possible how quickly we can get a COVID test result. And so when I'm working clinically, sometimes um, in Alberta, we have actually a rather decent testing capability. So for most people, on average, two to three days, um, they'll have their test result back within. There was um, a stretch last month when it kind of stretched out to six days. But if I need to transfer a patient and we need to know their COVID status, um, in as little as four to six hours, you can have a COVID result, which, you know, is kind of getting towards what we mean by point of care. Um, but what if we could instantly analyze a set of parameters like your body temperature, your biosignature, your, um, your proteins that were being exuded in your breath and come to a reasonably accurate, sensitive and specific level of how likely you are to have COVID at the spot. Think of how easily that would let us have access to um, public spaces like shopping malls and supermarkets and arenas again. So that's what we mean by point of care. Um, and we'll talk about how else that might be useful in when we talk about space next lecture. When we're talking about challenges and opportunities in health, um, the other thing I wanna bring your attention to is the WHO or World Health Organization definition of health because um, this really blew my mind when it was introduced to me when I was going through medical school. Um, and most of us, when we think of health, we think of just not being sick. Um, and that's a very North American type of um, viewpoint. And so the WHO vision of health is it's a state of the, not just the absence of disease, but complete physical, mental, social, and also sexual well-being. Um, so it's talking about how important it is not to just not be at the doctor, but also living your best, most functional, most product, productive life. Um, and during uh, my med school, medical school education, um, we had some practitioners of Eastern um, type medicine who said on the doctor's job is to keep the patient healthy, not just to cure them when they're sick. So it's not a big distinction until you think about it and you realize there's a world of difference between curing the sick and keeping you healthy. So I'm bringing this up to kind of lean you, steer you towards looking at opportunity spaces in medicine. The next opportunity space I wanna call your attention to is on the training side of medicine. So sometimes we have um, residents, fellows, medical students in this class. And if you're familiar with um, medical education, you'll be familiar with the CanMed's principles of how we train doctors. And so in Canada, the standard of being a, you know, a qualified doctor, regardless of whether you're a generalist or a specialist, is having those six facets of being professional, being a good communicator, being able to collaborate, being able to parse through medical literature and do so accurately, being able to advocate for your patients, as well as being a leader in your field. And that's what the definition of a medical expert is. Um, and so I hope these are getting the wheels turning in your head as we talk, start, start talking about problem spaces in medicine, which we're gonna spend the next section um, after this talking about, or actually as of now on this slide. Um, so before we talk about this, maybe let's kind of pause and turn it over to you. Are there any additional emerging opportunities or technologies that you've come across given that we have so much um, background and expertise in this in this virtual room so i have a question about the point of care uh, approach because if i imagine that maybe we can carry sensors in our cells maybe you know using nanotechnology we come up with these sensors that we just inject when we are newborns and, and they can 
give us uh, real-time data on our temperature or all these things that, that we look for uh, when we monitor a person. How do you think we are going to, to transition into the regulation of our privacy? Because I think that's a, a really uh, important topic. How do we come with new laws or new uh, um, yeah, legal parameters that respect our privacy and at the same time can give us that point of care um, approach that we would like to get to? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something I think we're still figuring out. And in certain respects, you know, we've already, for, for say, pediatric patients, they don't really have autonomy because they, they're, in most cases, unless it comes to a legal battle, um, are not the ones, they're not their primary decision maker. Um, so, for example, in most cases, the patient, the parents are the ones deciding whether or not to vaccinate their kids. And so even, even now, stepping outside of medicine, you know, kids growing up in 2000 and beyond have no say in their privacy because from the day they're born, um, their parents are usually putting them up on social media um, and, uh, and, and, you know, documenting their growth. And so it's a really important question to be thinking about. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to identify a problem space, a solution, but also you have to keep thinking about all of these things in tandem. You have to be thinking about um, the ethics, the policy, the regulatory framework that needs to change. You need to think about the, um, what the market opportunity is, uh, who's going to use it versus who's going to pay for it. All of these things come, come into play and it's really good that you're thinking about it um, now because it will play a theme in this lecture, in the space medicine lecture, and then in the workshop lecture where we put you guys to work to coming up with innovations and thinking about all of these things. Any other comments? All right, so we're gonna move into problem spaces. So before I get into that, what are some of the problem spaces that you foresee or that should come to mind in, in medicine? Um, sometimes it's very slow to make progress, especially in the lab. You're like, for instance, in my case, I research one molecule, I mean, one single molecule in, you know, in the entire human body, right? So it's slow. I see that, <laughs> that issue. Yeah, it's, it's slow in medicine, for sure, especially given the path towards uh, clinical use, you know, going through initial phase zero, one, two, three clinical testing. And then even looking at what's happening right now with AstraZeneca and they, you know, just a month ago, they were, you know, something like 800 million vaccines were ordered. They were par partnering with Oxford um, to create what was the most promising coronavirus vaccine. And then just with this week, trials were halted um, because one of the, there was an incident with uh, one of the trial participants getting sick. So, um, you know, it's always finding that balance between what can be pushed through with, with FDA and Health Canada waivers versus how do we do at the end of the day, what's in the best interest of the patient. So it's, you know, there's no right answer. There's nothing we're going to solve in the next 40 minutes here, but it's always, always, always important to keep coming at these from multidisciplinary, multifaceted approaches. I, I think one other thing that I would, um, I think is, is important is um, you sort of mentioned briefly the doctor patient relationship and how that's, it's super important. And I think there's, you know, there's very strong literature that shows, you know, that increases, you know, the experience of the patient, even, you know, management of chronic diseases, but, you know, in the, we're going into the future where there's so much AI and technology and people just looking up and Googling things. So, I think there's a gap in, in understanding like how that's actually affecting patient, uh, you know, uh, management of diseases or disorders or how that actually impacts, you know, taxpayer dollars in terms of, you know, misdiagnoses and all that. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Even, even as you say, like looking at the um, tradition, things we didn't traditionally look at, like the psychodynamics of the patient doctor relationship. 
And so, you know, on one end of the spectrum, there's a, there's a thing in medicine that doc, patients will never sue a doctor that they like, even if you, you screwed up horribly. If you had previously a good rapport with your patient, um, you know, it's in terms of a liability perspective, it's less likely to play out poorly for you. And then coming back to the, to the well-being, how it um, translates into patient outcomes. So for example, um, pain and pain management, doing that without any pharmaceuticals and managing the, the biofeedback cycle so you can stop a catecholamine release, for example, to, um, you know, that's, that's documented during labor. You know, if you can keep a patient calm, um, you can also help them manage their pain during labor. Um, then how does that translate into the current pandemic? We're seeing exacerbations of all of these psychosocial issues, whether it's mental health, whether it's domestic violence. So it's always, always important to keep in mind that how broad this definition of what falls into well-being and health is. I think one interesting thing for me from a non-medical background is that um, there's a lot of waiting times in hospitals for sp particularly specialists and i think with the increase of ais in medicine it um, may help that a lot but it also may take a long time for people to adapt to that new change in technology and conversing with an ai instead of a front-facing doctor yeah and that's you know that's exactly um you know what what i was alluding to earlier with um adoption you know you can have you can have the perfect cure you can have the vaccine for coronavirus but if you take 10 steps to get there if you're making it too hard for the patient to access they're not going to adopt it and so that's where that other aspect the marketing side of it becomes really important all right um let's keep plugging along all right so let's look at the problem side of um medicine now and some of the problem spaces some of which we've already covered through our discussion, but antibiotics and resistance is a huge issue. So even, even um, for as little time as I've been out in practice, some of what we were taught were, you know, the big gun antibiotics are now met with increasing resistance. And we really, um, it's kind of terrifying that what used to be a machine gun antibiotic is kind of mid-level on the spectrum and that there's even bigger gun antibiotics. And then the problem is anytime you engage with antibiotics necessary as they are, you're kind of hitting the nuclear option by zapping all the bugs in your body, the good and the bad, making you prone to unintended consequences from yeast infections to um, bacterial vaginosis to C. difficile infection. Um, and that's also keeping pace with the, the evolving bad bugs and trying to continually, um, you know, outpace them. Um, in terms of drug development, so we kind of alluded to this on the vaccine side, how challenging it is, what the cost of a clinical trial is, um, and then also trying to not only prove that something is not harmful, proving it is as good as the current gold standard, and then proving that it has an added benefit or cost benefit. Um, one really interesting trend that I've come across while teaching this course is called, what I like to call sock puppeting. Um, or drug repositioning. Um, and the reason I call it this is because what we're finding and what some labs like the Stanford Computer Science Lab has found by 3D modeling both drugs as well as receptors, we can look at the fit of how these pharmaceuticals can be used to be address other um, previously uh, not intended uses. So for example, uh, ACE inhibitors, in, uh, which is a blood pressure medication traditionally, um, have, have been found to have some um, analog to receptors in the lung and are implicated in certain types of lung cancer treatment. Um, patient context. I won't say too much about this because you guys hit it on the nail on the last slide about talking about patient dynamics. And I think I have an upcoming study on that in one of the next slides technologies we've kind of covered, whether they're smartphones, monitors, um, daily, uh, you know, quantified self, Fitbit type sensors, um, accessibility, Kaylin, you hit, you hit on that perfectly in the last slide. Um, and then just access in terms of drug affordability, longevity, side effect profile, selectivity. So, um, you know, a 
especially when you look at the healthcare model in the states, affordability, for example, with insulin, um, you know, is kind of a travesty. And then when we talk about um, challenges of space like environment in the next lecture, we'll be talking about how longevity is a challenge and um, what we can do to overcome that. So just to take a case study right now um, related to antibiotic resistance. So the WHO stance on this is it is happening everywhere, every point of the world, um, anyone, any age, any time, and it's a major threat to public health. Um, you know, since the advent of um, penicillin and other drugs, um, resistance has evolved with this over the past um, half century and more. And what we notice is um, a shocking percentage of antibiotics are inappropriately prescribed. Um, and this is why we're getting resistance. And part of this comes down to the patient context and also the psychodynamics. You know, um, clinically, when we don't always want to prescribe antibiotics, we, we actually end up having to fight not to prescribe antibiotics to a patient. Um, and then sometimes, you know, it's just easier to keep on going with your clinic day um, rather than have a 45 minute discussion with a patient as to why, you know, the antibiotics aren't appropriate. Um, and so, you know, this is, um, I think in previous versions of this lecture, I've had a slide on, you know, the rate of development versus the rate of resistance. And so for years and years, you know, we were kind of stuck with the, with the main drug classes, um, penicillins, beta-lactams, um, uh, fluoroquinolones, all of those things. And um, in 2016, we had our first breakthrough in decades called Tixobaxin. And the reason it took so long to get to this point um, is because the technology to isolate the active component of Tixobaxin. And so it was actually cultured from a soil um, organism and it was actually intracellular. So to be able to, to culture um, this soil organism um, had to, the technology wasn't there until the past five years. So I promised you a COVID slide, so here's a COVID slide. Um, so I don't think we could get away with having this lecture in 2020 um, without talking about COVID. Um, so <laughs> I don't think we need to kind of go over the, the prodrome of um, what coronavirus looks like, because I think we've all been, been made very aware and so this is kind of, I wish I had a side-by-side -side comparison because this is what coronavirus looked like six months ago. And um, the overlay right now would be all orange. Um, you know, every single corner of the uh, globe has been affected. Um, last week, I think I read this um, article that said one of the most remote and endangered um, tribes in Northern India has now had, they have 50 surviving members, and now five of them have been hospitalized with COVID. And so this endangered tribe, 10% has been infected with COVID. Um, but I did put a, the slide here because I wanted to talk about the opportunity in um, COVID, in coronavirus treatment. So we've kind of talked about the point of care detection. What are some other opportunities um, based on what we've talked about in the spectrum of care so far? Maybe uh, getting more data on, on how easily it is transmitted by asymptomatic people, because we still are, um, I don't think we know enough. Mm -hmm. And then we see all these outbreaks and, and uh, we don't understand how is it transmitted. The data is contradictory and that is confusing people and, and also they don't follow regulations because one person says one thing and then another one says another thing. So maybe uh, a better screening of which data is accurate would help in our control of the pandemic overall. And that's something that in my opinion is not there yet. Yeah, absolutely. The precision, the precision, this is where the precision medicine aspect comes into it. And, and you know, the problem is it's such a novel um, virus that everything keeps changing. So, you know, we know certain baseline risk factors like age and obesity and chronic conditions, but now we're seeing that things that we previously held to be true um, changing. So that's why we have masks now everywhere. That's why, 
you know, we're taking a second look at, you know, how pediatric populations are affected. Now we're seeing strokes, um, terrifying types of strokes in um, young, previously healthy adults. Um, so further stratification, so the big data, and um, I think I want to talk about this on another slide of what big data is and how we can mine that data. Um, so looking at trends, looking at the epidemiology, um, even looking at um, transmission risk. So, you know, for, I would say for the past six months, we've also been deep cleaning like crazy. We've been wiping down with chlorhexidine. We've been wiping down with hydrogen peroxide. And now the data is saying, well, actually, maybe there's one case study of surface to surface, surface to person transmission and um, contaminated surfaces aren't the risk that we think. It's all, it's all person to person transmission. Um, so that's another, you know, looking at transmission routes. Um, Anyone else with any thoughts on opportunity spaces? I was just going to mention that I think that with social media and so many different channels and where people get their information, there's a lot of in misinformation about that, especially mm -hmm. circulating around um, the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. And because of that, it's making people's trust of professionals in the field not like less, tr they don't have that level of trust anymore, especially since everything is changing. Um, and so being able to garner more trust between the, pa the population and the doctors is a really important thing that can be enhanced through social media, but is really hard once you kind of lose that trust. Yeah, absolutely. The biggest win I would say that coronavirus ever had against us is the psychological and the political one. Um, you know, the fact that people think that masks are a tool to control and keep the man down, right? COVID doesn't care who you vote for. It's like the honey badger. It don't care. Um, any other thoughts? Um, I think that COVID has brought out like a really weird thing that we didn't really look at before in that like the pandemic also kind of brought a pandemic pandemic of realizing that we lack a lot of compassion um, and it brings that out because almost everyone that it's affecting right now or people who are denying it or whatever they're not looking at it in like a compassionate way of like this is for other people it's not just about me and they're also not looking at the fact that like nobody knew how to deal with this this is a completely new thing for researchers for doctors for everyone and they're not looking at it in a compassionate way of like, nobody knew what we were doing. Like we're all just making stuff up as we go. So if stuff is kind of contradicting, it, we're not, nobody's doing it on purpose. It's just, we're all trying to do our best. And like, yeah, I just find the compassion part of it really lacking, or at least, I don't know if it brought it out, but it just made it more aware from other people. Yeah, absolutely. And so this call, you know, this could be a whole lecture unto itself of the psychodynamics and psychosocial issues that, you know, in coronavirus in and of itself, but even in healthcare, you know, it's, it's the, I swear I would have a Nobel Prize right now if I could figure out why people demanded antibiotics for their viral colds, but refused to take a blood pressure pill that will keep them alive for 20, 30 more years. So, um, you know, the psychology of medicine is another tough, tough nut to crack. Um, Kaylin, I see your comment that also brings the, the opportunities for interdisciplinarity. Um, yes, it does. And uh, keep, hold on to that thought because uh, if the, let me see how much time we have left. You guys are too interesting. I have like 60 more slides for 20 minutes. Um, so let's keep zipping along. Um, and let's talk about the, the additional remaining problem spaces in medicine and then talk about innovation um, and how we breed it. Back to the lecture. Okay, so we talked about sock puppeting. So this is more, um, you guys will have access to these slides. So this is kind of the link to what I was talking about with drug repositioning and how we're finding, um, for example, um, different drugs, like they call it the match.com for, for drugs and pairing previous, um, previously used drugs to new applications. So it's a, com a computer modeling drug bank. Um, we talked about 3D printing for food and for art. Well, now for casting as well. Has anyone here ever had to wear a cast um, before? 
Okay, who found it comfortable and had no problem with it? <laughs> Absolutely zero percent of you. Yeah, they're itchy, they're not fun, they can become too tight, they can become hot, um, and they can create pressure points. And so the ideal would be to have a cast that is waterproof, that can be taken off uh, for showers, that can be molded towards you. And so this is one Russian startup that created a 3D printed cast that fit your particular arm shape um, that could immobilize you to allow for um, bone healing. Um, and then they went a step further and added ultrasound, um, uh, an ultrasound component to it to uh, create high frequency vibrations that in early studies showed increased bone healing um, or decreased bone healing time. Next slide, and I see this comment in the chat. Um, another opportunity out of COVID is telemedicine. Excellent. Um, I literally just published a paper on this two days ago, um, but uh, let's, let's save that for a couple of slides from now when we talk about immersive medicine and technology. But yeah, fully on board, preaching to the choir. Um, personalization and genomics. And so what's the value? Why do we care about knowing what our gene structure is? Why do we care about knowing, you know, how you and I differ? Um, because it's all A's and T's and G's and C's at the end of the day, except when we turn it into clinical implications. So this was a part, um, project out of Harvard Medical School where they took all of this data that you could possibly get from the human genome and translate it into clinical value. Because, um, you know, as a practicing clinician, having, you have enough to do between seeing the patient, prescribing treatment, charting what you did, sending referrals, looking through labs, looking through scans, corresponding with pharmacy. So you don't want something more to read through, but you want something that will help you treat your patient better. And so in this case, they take all of that data that they parse from your genome and turn it into a one pager of how that would translate to your patient. So in this case, they look at the genetic variances and how they would respond to warfarin, for example, which is an anticoagulant or um, helps prevent blood clots. And so that's helpful because if I have a one pager that says, Mr. Smith, who's in my office right now, has a, um, uh, genetic propensity to need more warfare and that's going to make me start him at a higher dose and have less time to put him in the therapeutic range, for example. Um, so that's where the personalization and genomics aspect comes into medicine. So I know a lot of you mentioned AI and we're pretty excited about it. Um, so of course we had to plug Watson in here. And so when we talk about how AI and machine learning can be applied towards medicine, there is no, there is no textbook answer because if it were easy enough to, to write medicine in a single textbook, then robots could already be doing our jobs. And so the role for medicine, for AI in medicine right now is to help us do diagnostics better, make better clinical decisions, make us be more accurate, be more safe. Um, and so we'll talk about that again. I'm trying to entice you to come into next lecture and how AI and other technologies will help us for, for exploration class um, human spaceflight mission. Um, but uh, you know there there is a role, but it's not it's not having AI and having robots take over doctors' jobs, but rather to supplement them. And then last but not least patient context and lifestyle. So we talked about how the psychosocial dynamics matters um, and how taking patient context matters. Um, and so here's, here's a simple example, looking at divorce and the risks for getting a heart attack. And what this one study, I think this was out of Duke University concluded, um, is that divorce is a significant risk factor for a myocardial infar infarct. Um, particularly in women, and some of you may remember over the past few years, studies have come out saying that marriage is protective against mortality for men, um, and versus uh, seems to shorten lifespan in women. So draw your own conclusions there. Um, hopefully that won't impact your life choices though. All right, this is my favorite. Uh, you know I'm a crazy bird person. Um, so 
on the other side, we talked about innovation, we talked about high tech solutions, but innovation doesn't necessarily mean going to high tech Jetson style future um, looking solutions, but just thinking differently. And so I always poke fun at Kim's on the slide because this is a study that trained pigeons to look at breast cancer pathology slides. And when the pigeons looked at, um, picked up breast cancer accurately, um, they were rewarded with bird seed. And what they found is that pigeons um, could be trained with 98%, so better accuracy than a pathology, uh, uh, than a pathologist to pick up breast cancer. Um, and then when they flock sourced it, so when they left the decision to multiple birds, the accuracy went up even more. So if um, someone ever tells you pathologies for the birds, um, take it as a compliment. But remember, this comes back to our theme about talking about how innovation is just technology it's about thinking differently all right so to cap off this section um we've talked about emerging trends in medicine we've talked about some of them in depth but here's um and so you have brought up some of them um in our discussion so we talked about 3d printing we've talked about big data um, geolocation and smartphone apps using the the data that we get from looking at where we are. Um, so for example, in um, one study, when they looked at how Google searches for um, leg cramps correlated with buying a certain type of supplement, they also found that there was a seasonal component and realized that leg cramps were seasonal. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot we can get about parsing data and looking, pairing it with circumstance and geography. Um, we talked about the six P's of medicine. Um, there's other themes that we talk about when we're trying to talk about designing for the future. So faster, better, cheaper, smaller. Um, so that's kind of where nanomedicine and nanobots come into play. Uh, we already talked about data, data mining and machine learning. And of course, VR, AR. So I'm um, going to spend a couple of minutes talking about this. So when we talk about immersive medicine, um, we talk about um virtual reality augmented reality and 360 video so this is also known by lots of names extended reality um i think the u of a actually has a director of extended reality for medicine um and so we talk about using technologies and how these immersive technologies can augment education training and patient care so that's actually one of the hats I wear. So I'm the VP of Immersive Medicine at Luxonic Technologies, so a Saskatoon co based um, uh, company. And so um, we'll talk more about this in the space lecture. But basically, my job is to develop um, immersive medical training modules for space. Because when you're six to nine months out from Earth um, on Mars, you also have to deal with the fact that you're medically isolated. So when you're in orbit on the International Space Station, there's no time delay. When you're on the moon, there's a three second one way time delay. When you're on Mars, depending on the alignment of the planets, that turns anywhere from six to 23 minutes one way. Um, so you could at, at the most be facing a 46 minute time delay, um, which isn't ideal in a medical emergency. So ideally, you want to be able to have technologies that augment your physician, your crew physician capability. Um, and you also want to be able to practice your medical skills because you don't want to learn to do an IV just once on Earth during training and then um, figure out, oh, hey, I think I put the pointy end in the patient, but, you know, try to figure out how it goes after. Um, so that's one, of the, one example of immersive technologies um, applied for medicine, VR for practicing procedures. Um, also, as, as is very evident by this class itself, um, there's a role for virtual learning. So um, how do we take the fact that we're out of the classroom, out of the hands-on lab, and use immersive technologies to help with the educational component? So um, that, that's kind of an intro to what I do. I'll try to give you some more information next, next um, class as we talk more about um, exploration class missions. All right, so we've talked about medicine in particular. So what I'll do in the 10 minutes we have left is 
talk about the opportunities and problem spaces and then finish off with the themes that drive innovation. So this is kind of taking a broad step back. And as you've clearly deduced based on the fact that you're from all manner of background in this class is that we have lots of problems and they're not going away soon and they're not restricted to medicine. Um, and so this is just to get you thinking about how else can we look at solving problems on a grand scale. So, um, you know, when we look at human migration problems and human rights issues, there are more people currently enslaved at any time um, at present than at any time in human history. Um, there are more refugees currently worldwide than there were at any time uh, in human history and more than during the Second World War. When it comes to mapping and exploration, we actually know more about the, the mapping of the surface of the moon than we do about the, the oceans. We've only mapped about 5% of the ocean's floors to date. And when we look at what that means for um, ecosystem mapping in terms of mineral mining, um, there's a lot to be discovered still. Um, pretty sure I don't need to tell you that climate change is an issue. Um, and then just in terms of equality, I think this year in, in, its, in of itself has under, under, underscored a lot about how far we have to go in terms of equality with respect to gender, with respect to LGBT rights, with respect to um, uh, race equality. So the good news is there's lots of problems for you to solve. Okay. So in the closing stretch of this class, let's talk about pathways towards innovation. So I want to talk about four themes. Talk about the value of people, building bridges, developing that innovation mindset, what kind of environments foster innovation, and then what kind of experiences we can cultivate to help foster innovation and engineer that future that we need. So someone earlier, I forget who, I think it might have been Kaylin, talked about the value of, of different disciplines. Um, and so we talked, and someone, I forget who, talked about the value of that developing and put your PhD a very, very, very specific piece of the puzzle. You're simply working on a single molecule. And so when we talk about creating innovation, it's slightly, it's like emerging from that deep dive, that silo in which you exist, and fostering cross bridges between those disciplines to look at the same perspective. Um, from a from a totally different angle. So if you think about those illusions where you're looking at, is it two faces or is it a vase? Or looking at the current slide, is it is it particulate need matter or is it art? Um, and so that's one of the points that I've learned and want to hammer home when it talks to how the people and teams can build um, uh, innovation. And so I like to say you don't need to be a brain surgeon and a rocket scientist because there's seven billion of us. And so it's by taking those experiences and sharing them. And two classes from now, um, assuming I can make use of the breakout room feature on Zoom, we're going to be working in teams to help help hammer that home. Um, this is more of a lesson learned, um, kind of based on my experience as an entrepreneur, is the power of working in small, lean teams and then empowering people. Um, and that's kind of a leadership. Um, in and of itself. And I think I can spend a lot of time talking about the value of, of cultivating a, a equitable workplace, but maybe I will just plug on to talk about mindset. So what kind of mindset foster innovation? So I think most of you have heard of the word growth mindset. Um, and it can seem like a, a buzzword, but what does that mean to you, the term? Um, I think there's obviously like actual definitions for it in terms of um, not letting, like not thinking of like a predefined skill set or limiting yourself to that. I think personally, I kind of see it as just taking on new opportunities and challenges as, and seeing them as ways to learn and like grow your skill set. And again, like not really specialize specifically in only one thing, but getting to know other areas and learning from those cross cross disciplinary teams as well. 
Yeah, perfect. And so I want to speak specifically to mindset in terms of culti cultivating an exponential outlook. Um, the other, but we'll get to that in a couple slides. So the other thing is developing a that that outlook to start looking how, for how to develop innovation. And so the first thing I like to say is question everything. And it starts with a simple two word question. Just ask, first of all, how can I make this better? How can I make this better? And then just ask, what if? Um, and so this is a case study I've used in previous years. This was a 17 year old girl who volunteered in hospitals and looked at dialysis machines and said, well, what if I could make this better? Um, they're expensive, they're 30, they're five, um, they're five figures to buy a single dialysis machine. What if you're in a disaster, you can't bring your di dialysis machine with you. So she built a um, dialysis machine that was ordered of magnitude cheaper out of the size of a suitcase. So it comes down to asking that simple, what if question. Um, this is another case study, but this is how Again, pointing to the value of looking at simple ways of thinking differently and not necessarily looking at high tech solutions. So, this is um, Semmelweis, and his big innovation was saying, Well, what if we all just washed our hands before attending to a pregnant patient after we were in the, in the morgue? And people laughed at him. Um, but sure enough, when he introduced the radical idea of washing our hands, um, he was able to decrease mortality rates with post-corporal fevers in pregnant patients. But the thing was, this was a crazy idea at the time, and he was actually spent his days in an insane asylum because he was locked out of his field because of this radical innovation. Okay. So I want to talk about exponential mindsets now. So when we talk about exponential thinking, um, think about running on a treadmill. So if you're increasing in arithmetic fashion, you're increasing at one kilometer per hour, then two kilometers, then three kilometers, you're going a very linear stepwise fashion, and it's easy to keep up. When we think about increasing in a geometric or exponential fashion, you're doubling your rate at every step. So you talk about going at one kilometer, then two kilometers, okay, you're going a bit faster, four kilometers, then eight kilometers, you're breaking out into a jog. And then at as you keep doubling your rate, suddenly you're sprinting at 16 kilometers per hour. And then if you're me, when you go up to 32 kilometers per hour, you fly off the treadmill and hit the wall. And so the reason I want you to think about exponential technology is because we need to learn to adapt this mindset because we're not programmed to think that way. But even if you think about how it's been maybe just over a decade since smartphones have pervaded our lives to doing our banking, ruling our security, acting as a phone, tracking our families, being, uh, you know, being a multi Swiss army knife of a tool. Um, that's one way to help bridge and build the future. So when we look at exponential thinking in communication, it took the radio, how many years? 38 years to reach 50 million people. It took Facebook two years to do the same thing. The last Taylor Swift music video took less than 24 hours to do that. The other way to think about exponential thinking is using it as a disruptive force. So what happened to the bookstore? It was replaced by the big box bookstore, so Barnes Noble, Chapters, um, Indigo. Well, what happened to the big box bookstore? Well, all of a sudden, Amazon came on with their warehouses and were able to disrupt the disruptor by shipping out books. And so using disruptive and exponential thinking, Amazon was able to be its own competitor with the advent of the Kindle and the ebook. Same thing with Netflix and Blockbuster. So once upon a time, if we wanted to watch a video, we would have to go all the way to the video store on a Friday night and you know plug in our VCR. And then suddenly Netflix said, well, what if we could bring DVDs to the patient? And then as tele telecommunications and internet became more pervasive, um, you know, they came, became the first online streaming service. All right, so in the next couple of minutes here, I want to go through our last um, learning point and theme on innovation. So 
environment. So how do we foster that innovation environment? So we can physically engineer our workspaces. So how do we facilitate that for teams and for others? So we'll talk about these um, facilitating the innovation process. Um, but I want to talk about the value of fostering a physical environment. Fostering, think about, think about for those of you who have a chemistry background, being a catalyst for all those molecules to interact. So in the same way, Pixar actually has designed its physical workspace to have different disciplines um, interact with each other. So the bathroom and the mailroom is very, very central. So to be able to get to it, whether you're working in animation, whether you're working in marketing, you have to pass by each other. And the idea is that this physical workspace will foster um, conversations that would have not otherwise not have happened. Same with Google and the open floor, floor space plan. So the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to environments is this is the perfect time to be alive. If you want to be an innovator and a disruptor. You have all of these online platforms that never existed. You can broadcast yourself with YouTube and SoundCloud. You can teach yourself through massive online open courses. You can teach yourself through Khan Academy. You can fund your project with Kickstarter. Um, and then there's all of these hardware options like Raspberry Pi and Arduino and Google um, or sorry, Oculus Rift, Rift headsets that exist out there. Finally, you saw these questions in the last um, last theme section. So experience. So when we look at innovators and we study the traits that have got them to and compared them to the general population. They have five traits that are above what we call non-innovators. So they make associations between unlike concepts. So that's there's that cross-disciplinarity and asking, um, you know, how might these interact? Questioning, asking how can this be better? How can I make this better? And asking what if? Simply observing a process. You know, think back to observing Semmelweis's observation of postpartum patients and maternal mortality, and then experimenting, um, washing your hands and seeing how that affects the outcome. And then finally, we kind of alluded to this, but we haven't talked about it outright, networking, building bridges between disciplines. So in summation, here are um, the four themes that I've hoped that you've gotten away, gotten from this lecture on things that foster innovation, people, mindset, environment, and experience. And if you forget, don't worry about it because we're gonna put this all into practice two lectures from now. Um, so the last thing I wanna leave you with is inspiration for the future. So maybe create your own Terminator, Tumorinator uh, future scenarios, um, think about technologies that don't exist yet because we're going to talk about them over the next two lectures. Um, I'll save these lectures for or these videos for the next lecture. And I just want to give you a sense of the lecture ahead. So where did that go? Okay. So for next time we'll be talking about space medicine, um, designing for the space flight environment as well as the challenges um, that come with it, emerging technologies, which we've talked about a little bit today. And then finally, to get yourselves into the innovation headspace, my challenge to you is an optional homework assignment is design your own Tumorinator scenario. Um, you know, what kind of problem can you solve with really radical thinking and novel thinking, either high tech or not? Um, pick a sector that you're versed in, whether it's marketing or healthcare, and design a future scenario for it. And then just take a, take a notepad and wander through your environment and just note down in inefficiencies and how can this be better, whether it's food storage, whether it's how your microwave works. Um, and then just ask, how can this be better? What skill set do you have to make this better? And ask your what if question. So we've gone a little bit over. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, here is my contact information. Um, and then also for those of you who are on social media, there's my Twitter handle. So thank you very much. Um, I'm around for questions for the next little bit, but I also understand if you have to go. I'm thank you. Um, for, for the homework, do we need to deliver it on, on e-class? 
or? This is more of a kind of to get your thinking caps on. It's totally optional. So the, um, because I know you guys have a lot going on, I try not to do out of class homework. So any actual, this is more if you're really interested in becoming, developing your, your innovation um, skill set. Um, but anything we do will be in class. So two lectures from now will be, a, assuming I can get the breakout teacher to work, I'm going to experiment with it, we'll be doing an in-class workshop. Okie doke. All right, you guys, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks again, Kim, for having me. Thank you. Okay. See you next time. <laughs> See you next time. I did have a question for you just at the end. Oh no, she left. Oh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> well, you you can. Um, she's on uh, Slack, uh, and and you know there are, you could send her email, so on. But okay. also, she 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 does have quite a packed day. I'm sure she is somewhere else to be, you know. So that's that's why she left like that, I think. For sure, for sure. I'll try to get her on Slack or on email. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Uh one one more thing, guys, with the the future and all that jazz. Um we could think more full province. You know, it wouldn't have to be in the in the Edmonton area, could be in Calgary or you know so somewhere between here and there. So I just want to mention that to kind of broaden the concept, um, since we don't seem to have any anybody making specific suggestions for uh, venues so far. And the window's kind of closing because Mallory starts her uh, graduate program. In, in early October. So, I mean, we kind of have to do it this month if we're, <laughs> we're going to do it. So, mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention that, 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 that it uh, doesn't have to be in Edmonton. Okay, great. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. <clears throat>